Hello everyone and welcome to this video tutorial on mens rea. Mens rea means the guilty mind and it refers to the mental element of a criminal offence. Remember that in order to be found guilty of a crime, the defendant needs to meet the actus reus and the mens rea of the offence. The actus reus is the physical act or omission that they must have committed and the mens rea is the mental element. And the mental element could be, for example, intention to steal, or it might be taking a risk as to whether harm could be caused to somebody. And there are various ways of categorising different levels of mens rea, and intention is clearly more culpable than mere recklessness. So we're going to have a look at the different types of mens rea in this tutorial today. On this slide, in case you're too young and cool to know who they are, this is Pinky and the Brain. And what I'm trying to show you here with the brain is the three types of mens rea that you need to know about. Direct intent, indirect or it's sometimes called oblique intent and subjective recklessness. Firstly, what you can see from this picture here is that there are two types of intention and that might surprise you to start with because most people think of intention as just being direct intent, that the defendant aims to do the crime. But there is another type of intention, which is slightly more complicated, which we're going to look at today as well. And then we've got recklessness, which is a lower level. Direct intent is probably the one that, that you understand already. So direct intent, an example would be, I intend to kill Chris because he's really annoying, so I shoot him and kill him. There, I've aimed to do the crime. I intended to kill and I have killed him. That's nice and straightforward. Indirect or oblique intent is a lesser form of intention where the defendant still aimed to cause harm, but not the harm that actually occurred. And you can see here that intention extends beyond aim and includes foresight by D of a virtual certainty. And that sounds a bit complex, but it means that they intended the act, but not the consequences. So to give you a practical example of that, let's say that I decide um, I want to stop students getting into Cronton College. So I decide to push concrete blocks off a bridge onto um, a motorway just to stop the traffic getting to college. And that concrete actually hits a car and kills somebody. Now, in that situation, I intended to block the road. I didn't intend to kill. But if you push concrete off a motorway bridge onto a busy road, then you can say that it was virtually certain that you would cause death or serious injury. And therefore, the law says that you have oblique intent. And we'll look at this a bit more closely with some cases. So don't worry if you don't totally understand that yet. The other type of mens rea that we've got here is subjective recklessness. And this is where the defendant is aware he might do the prohibited act. It's the taking of an unjustified risk. A classic example of recklessness would be lighting a fire by a haystack. So we're going to look at each of these more closely with some cases which will help to explain the different types of mens rea. Let's start by having a look at direct intention. So direct intent is quite straightforward um, because direct intent is where the defendant embarks on a course of conduct to bring about a particular result which occurs. So I gave you the example before, I hate Chris, so I get a gun and shoot him dead. That would be an example of direct intention. And we've got a useful definition of direct intention from the case of Mohan. And the court defined direct intent as where the defendant's aim, objective or purpose was to bring about the prohibited result. So we've got three key words there, aim, objective or purpose. So make sure you use those in the exam. So direct intent is where they have aimed specifically to carry out what in fact occurred. What you need to be careful with when you're looking at direct intent is that you don't confuse motive with intention. Intention differs from motive or desire. Motive is a reason why someone might commit a crime. So it might be that I kill my husband to get his life insurance policy. My motive is to get his money. Sometimes you might encounter um, crimes where you could say that the defendant might have good motives for committing the crime. 
So a person who kills a loved one um, who was dying from a terminal illness in order to put them out of their pain and suffering might be said to have a good motive for killing. However, they still have direct intent because although maybe you can say, oh, they had a nice reason, yeah, but they still intended to kill them. So the motive is irrelevant. And we're going to look at a really interesting case on this now. The case of Dudley and Stevens from 1884 is really famous and it's got some very grisly facts. We had three sailors, Dudley, Stevens, and there was a third sailor, a man called Brooks, and a younger cabin boy were shipwrecked. And they were adrift in an open boat 1,600 miles from land. So they are in a little life raft. And at first they had some supplies, so they lived off um, a tin of turnips and they caught a turtle. But eventually they ran out of food and water. And after eight days, the situation was very serious. The young cabin boy, who I think was about 16 years old, had drunk some seawater and he was very ill and dying in this life raft. And so the three sailors were looking at this ill cabin boy and thinking, he's going to die anyway. And our only chance of survival is if we kill and eat him. Um, and that's what they did. So they killed this cabin boy and they fed on his flesh and his blood. And as luck would have it, um, a boat came and rescued the sailors and they confessed to their crime, to what they'd done. They were convicted of murder because their direct intent was to kill, even though they'd done it to survive. And our principle here is that intention is not the same as motive. Motive is irrelevant. And this does seem quite harsh because they're in a really extreme situation here. They're going to die otherwise. So the reason for committing that murder was to survive. But that was no defence um, because their motive to survive simply proved that their aim, objective and purpose was in fact to kill him. So they're guilty of murder. Interestingly, though, if you look at the date, um, we had the death penalty back then. But because of the sort of extreme circumstances that the defendants were in, the court did take pity on them um, and they weren't given the death penalty. And they served some time in prison before they were released. In case you're wondering why it's just Dudley and Stevens and Brooks isn't one of our defendants, um, Brooks actually turned state's witness. So he was um, a witness for the prosecution in return for immunity. Um, so that's why we've just got the two names here, our two defendants. So that's direct intent then. The defendant's aim, objective and purpose was to bring about the prohibited act. And we've seen from Dudley and Stevens that your motive, your reason for doing it is irrelevant. It will simply prove that you intended the outcome. Let's move on then and look at the next type of intention, which is oblique intention. And unfortunately, this is a little bit more complicated. So oblique, or sometimes it's called indirect intention, is where the defendant intended the act, but not the consequences. So in this example I've given you here, our defendant has set fire to his council house to try and get a bigger one. So his direct intent when he set this fire is to get a bigger house. But his oblique intention in this case was the death of his six children. Now you might recognize that what I'm referring to here on this slide is actually a real case. Um, and it was in 2013. This was Mick Philpott, um, who you can see here was jailed for life after he set his council house on fire and it resulted tragically in the death of his six children who were pictured there. And I've just explained um, that his aim was to get a bigger house. He did not want his children to die. However, he's still guilty of murder because although his direct intent was to get a bigger house, his oblique intent was the death of all of his children. Because it's virtually certain that if you set fire to your house while all your children are asleep in bed, it's virtually certain that you're going to cause death or serious injury. So the law says that you intended it. 
To give another example, this is another case actually, Hancock and Shankland. Um, in this case, our defendants pushed concrete off a bridge and their direct intent was to stop miners getting to work. But the concrete actually hit a car um, and somebody was killed. So again, that, the direct intent was to stop miners getting to work. But the oblique intent was death of the taxi driver. Because if you push concrete off a bridge, it's virtually certain that you're going to cause death or serious injury. So again, the law is saying that you intended this consequence of your main action. And as I've been giving you those examples, I've actually been referring to the test for oblique intent, which came from the case of Medrick. In this case, our defendant poured paraffin, which is highly flammable, through a letterbox and threw a match in to set fire to it because his intention was just to scare the lady who lived there. But tragically, her little child who was in the house at the time was killed. So he didn't set out that day to kill a child. But if you go around setting fire to a house, it's very, very likely that you might cause that death or serious injury. So the Court of Appeal created a two-part test for oblique intent. And the jury said, um, sorry, the court said that the jury are entitled to infer, that means find, that the defendant had the necessary intention if, and this is what we call the two-part test for oblique intent, death or serious injury was a virtual certainty and the defendant realised that was the case. So what this is meaning is, in a case like this, where a defendant's done something silly like that, they poured paraffin through a letterbox and killed someone, when they're arguing and saying, but I didn't intend to kill anyone, I was intending to scare somebody, the jury will be asked, was death or serious injury a virtual certainty as a result of setting fire to that house? And you would say, yeah, wouldn't you? Serious injury at the very least. And did the defendant realise that? Yes. And the only situation really where the defendant's not going to realise that would be perhaps if they were a child or if they were mentally ill. On this same issue of oblique intent, we then had the case of Woolen, a tragic case where the defendant was frustrated with his baby who had colic and it never stopped crying. And in a moment of pure, ah, shut up. He flung the baby and it hit the wall, suffered serious head injuries and died. And this case you can see here approved the Nedrick test. And they said, yeah, we like the Nedrick test, but we're just going to change the word infer to find. So if I just flick back to the previous slide, you'll notice that in the test, the Court of Appeal said they're entitled to infer the necessary intention. Well, in Woolen, they just said they were going to change that green infer to find. But basically, they, they like the test. The final case on oblique intent is Matthews and Align, where our horrible defendants threw a victim from a bridge into the River Ouse, um, even though the victim was screaming that he couldn't swim. And again, the, the jury were given the uh, Nedrick test for oblique intent. And the principle here was that it's always going to be up to the jury. The jury will decide, did the defendant realise that death or serious injury was a virtual certainty? The contention seems a little bit complex, but we've got these three key cases, Nedrick, Woolen and Matthews. Make sure you know those principles for those. The final type of mens rea you need to be aware of is recklessness. And this is the taking of an unjustified risk. And in Cunningham, we were told that recklessness does not require any ill will to the victim. So the court was just meaning there that the defendant just has to be reckless as to whether such harm should occur or not, i.e. the accused has foreseen that the particular kind of harm might be done and they've gone on to do it anyway. The final case on recklessness is R and G and R. Um, and the reason we've not got names here is that these were children. So we've just got the initials there. The boys were just 11 and 12 and they'd gone camping um, and they were messing about with some old newspapers outside a co-op and they lit them with a lighter um, and threw them under a wheelie bin. Um, and then they left without putting out um, the newspapers and this spread and caused a lot of damage. Now, because these were young children, the court found them not guilty because they said, well, they weren't aware that they were taking a risk. 
You can see the test is subjective and to be guilty with recklessness, the defendant must realise he's taking a risk and do it anyway.